Google Slides. <laughs> Being all thick. I feel like you already referenced it. So yeah, I'll run this track that joke. I'm like, it's very Instagram to be on that screen right now. They want to say it's clear. They want to say it's clear. Um, and during our research, this quote actually stood out. 
Um, there was an entire book based off of healthcare design. It's the messages conveyed by a waiting room can be direct or subliminal. Everything from the arrangement of seating to the type and intensity of lighting has an impact on the patient's mood and well-being. We saw this not just for the patient, but also for the loved ones that are there supporting and caring for the patient, for the employees that were there. So when we were doing our research, we actually focused on our problem first. Yeah, so taking it way back to the beginning when we were first coming up, let's kind of identify what problem area we wanted to affect. Um, we did the whole user frame to train our exercise, and there's these three possibilities that we came up with. Um, the first was trying to affect children um, who are coming to the hospital for a major procedure. Uh, that's just uniquely stressful because the child um, doesn't really know what's going on in the hospital, um, let alone necessarily why, like, why they're there. Um, and so one possible solution for that um, is some kind of special product that the child can receive, like, like a teddy bear um, or a little like, candy or something like that as part of uh, the process, and that would kind of help relieve that. Um, that didn't seem too convincing uh, or exciting for any of us. Um, it seemed like there was kind of a lot already going on in that space, uh, so we didn't want to try to step on that. Um, the second one was um, families with short-term patients, so just like Grace was saying, this is like the loved ones of patients, not the actual patients themselves. Um, so their primary experience in hospitals is just waiting for information, so they're sitting there, uh, maybe trying to support their loved one, but for the most part, there's nothing good they can actively do. Um, and so in order to uh, improve that, we would be looking at the communication experience, um, and seeing how we can kind of innovate there, and how uh, the relationship between a loved one of a patient and the hospital looks, instead of the patient themselves in the hospital. Um, and then the third thing we looked at was first-time patients, um, and a kind of improvement for this would be maybe some kind of special screening uh, or advisor that the first-time patient coming in would get, so that we get some of the like, context and background information that like someone who has never been to a hospital before uh, would get. When we talked all these three things over, we decided to settle on the middle one, so families with short-term patients. Um, so we think really the, the core idea behind a hospital is this relationship between uh, basically loved one and the patient in the hospital and how, to, how the home communication fits together. Uh, so Vina next is going to talk about how that communication fits in uh, with the kind of the current scheme that hospitals are at. Yeah, so when we first approached this problem with how to innovate in the waiting room area, we looked at all the different parts of the hospital system. There's like the EMTs, the doctors, the nurses, the patients, and then now what we're trying to look at the loved ones. When we're looking at all these different portions of a hospital system, we realized a lot of them had different parts of the model and how they were all communicating with each other. And we found that they had some that really ran through the entire the entire healthcare or hospital process. And we really wanted to hone in on the communication, the service, and the experience for all these different components of the healthcare system. And we thought this is really where our product fit in. And this is one of the situations where after going through, this was actually the very beginning of this class because a lot of us didn't come in with very much actual research and experience working with artificial intelligence and what you could do and what has been done. And so this was something where it really kind of was the backbone to all of our research and our product today because patients, we recognize there's so much attention on the patient. They have a nurse, there's most of the time there's a separate room set aside for them. There's a constant care loop. They always have like an emergency button in case something goes wrong. But for everyone that's there that loves them, it's like a hard metal seat and like a smile from the nurse. Like it's not, it's the same situation where they come out and tell you that your loved one died. Like there should be an entire system in place to help because care is not just one way. It's a two way street. Um, so what we're actually going to do is we're just going to jump right in to where we actually ended up and show you how we think that this could play out in the future. This is definitely a forward thinking. We're going to do a scene actually with Jill. This is definitely a forward thinking scene, um, especially because a lot of this technology doesn't exist at the moment. But we just kind of want to show you where we think in five or ten years um, this could end up in, in, you know, in a positive situation. Or actually, do you want to tell them who's here? Yeah, so we have a couple of our characters here. Um, Grayson is going to play the voice of Eve itself. Uh, so you hear Grayson talking about with Eve. Uh, assistant, basically speaking. Uh, Jill is going to play Rebecca, um, and Avi is going to play George. Uh, George and Rebecca are married. Uh, they both work uh, in town, but separately. Um, and actually, today, when they were both driving home from work, uh, George rides a motorcycle, and unfortunately, he got in a car accident. Um, so, George was rushed to the hospital. Uh, Rebecca got a phone call, and she rushed to the hospital as well. Um, Gabriella is going to be our nurse. Um, and so, where we're jumping in the scene is uh, George is already in the hospital, and Rebecca has just arrived. In Uh, hi, hello. Uh, who do I talk to? Uh, 
Okay. My husband, George Crawford, who's in a wreck, just got the call and came over. Where is he? Um, good morning. What was his last name? Crawford. George Crawford. Okay, yes, he is here. He just came in about 20 minutes ago, and he's being prepped for surgery. Uh, oh my god, this is so bad. Where can we see him? Um, well, it will be a while, but you can wait here until I can see visitors. And um, while you wait, can you fill out these forms? The top is a consent form, and the bottom is an insurance form. And we actually have a new exciting system in uh, the hospital today. It's kind of like an Alexa, but better. It's called Eve, and in order to get access, you just have to check the Eve box here, and that's all you've got to do. Um, but let me know if you need anything. Hi, Rebecca. I. <laughs> what the hell? Hello? <laughs> Hi, I'm Eve. I'm new here at the hospital. I'm here to help you. I. Where are you? What are you? Um, I'm everywhere. You can only hear me right now, but I can be your care companion if you'd like. I can get your information about this hospital, answer your questions, and make sure you're taken care of. May I help you today? Sure. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of freaked out, actually. I understand. If you can please sign the consent form in your lab and hand it to the nurse, I can learn more about you. Thank you for letting me help today. So, George just came in about 22 minutes ago and is being prepped for surgery. He was in a car accident and the ambulance arrived shortly after. One of his ribs is broken and, he needs to, and it needs to be reset to avoid any internal bleeding. It should take about six hours, but he is in great care. Would you like me to call your mom? Uh, yeah, yeah, yes. Here, here she is. Hi, mom. Uh, so at this point, Rebecca would have a conversation with her mom. Uh, we won't play the whole thing out. But it's important to note that at one point, uh, Rebecca forgets one of the uh, terms for what happened to her, her husband. She forgot that he actually broke his rib. Uh, and so Evie is actually able to step in and provide that information to help facilitate the communication between Rebecca and her mom. Oh, don't worry. Uh, once you gave me permission to help, I went ahead and shared your details with the front desk. You're all good. Um, uh, Eve? Yes? What are you? I'm your digital care companion. I'm here to help while you're at the hospital, because I understand this is a stressful time. Can other people hear you, or are you just not hear you? I can help anyone in the hospital. With small, things, with small things such as bathroom directions, all the way to helping you keep up with your personal life while you're here. I'm even helping the doctors and nurses who work here. So like what kind of help? Well, if you'd like, I can send a message to your, usual, to your usual babysitter so she can pick up the kids from soccer practice and stay with them until you get back. I, I, I forgot about soccer practice. I, please, let me know what happened. Did uh, you see if she can pick up the kids today? No problem. I just sent her a text. Thank you. Of course. Oh, also, when your husband got here, I let his office know that he won't be coming in tomorrow. I didn't even think of that. I, I'm not feeling like myself right now. I mean, but what if the crash had been worse? Well, you're handling the situation very well, but I'm here to help if you need anything. He's doing great so far. Um, he's, his calm, he is calm, and his surgery is right on track. And actually, you can listen to his heart rate right now. He is with two of the best doctors here. There's Michael Strand and Leslie McGowan. They both have specialized in abdominal surgery. He's in great hands. Uh, so a few hours later, or a few hours pass, uh, Rebecca's feeling a little bit calmer, but she's still very concerned about her husband, so she refuses to leave away her. She hasn't left her seat yet. There is a bathroom down the hall if you need it. <laughs> You've been here for a while, and while I wouldn't eat the cafeteria food, I know the nurse at the front desk has some snacks. Her name's Gabriella. Thanks. Sure thing. Uh, it is late. George has about an hour or two left of his surgery, but if you doze off, don't worry. I can wake you if there's any news. Uh, I also sent Emily a message. Uh, your kids ate dinner, and they're asleep now. Should I go ahead and pay her? Oh. Please do. Um, she's so sweet. Uh, so a little bit more time passes, and Rebecca actually falls asleep in the waiting room. Rebecca? Rebecca? Uh, yeah, what is it? Is, is George okay? Yes, he actually just got out of surgery, and he did really well. The surgery took less time than we expected. Um, he woke up a few minutes ago and immediately asked about how the basketball game went. Thank God. He's okay. He will need to rest at home for about a week. 
and I put calendar reminders for you when he needs to take his medications, and we emailed his office again to let him know that he'll be out on medical leave for next week. I'm just happy he's okay. Is there anything else he needs? He needs to take an iron and calcium supplement, and I know he hates taking pills, so I just ordered the highest rated gummies from Amazon, and I'll arrive tomorrow morning. <laughs> you can visit him in about an hour, but in all honesty, he just needs to hear your voice right now. Rebecca? George. And that's it. I love theater. <laughs> so, we went through a lot right there. There's a lot of things, privacy, how it works, how it is human, that incredible voice. So we're just going to break down kind of a couple of moments that we have and then kind of tell you how we got here and the decisions that we made because we've gone through a lot of things based on ethical considerations and what makes the system human. So the way we broke down this scene when we were writing it is we decided to define a couple of moments. And a moment is an interaction where Eve is proactive and improves the user's life in a way that they were unaware of themselves. Some of this technology exists now, but it's going a step further than Siri or Alexa where it's... Uh, more of a chatbot and it's more of a request. In this case, as you guys saw, Eve was able to take what it knows about the user and proactively try and help in those small moments. So we had five moments overall. Um, we're going to go ahead and focus on two and it was when Eve contacted the babysitter and when Eve stepped in and was comforting, um, called the mom and was trying to anticipate the wife actions like when she fell asleep or when she might have been getting hungry. Okay, so let's dive right in to when Eve was contacting the babysitter. So basically, Rebecca was kind of freaking out, but then Eve proactively asked Rebecca if she needed help contacting her babysitter for her kids because this is something she probably would have forgotten in a high anxiety, stressful situation. So how we sort of broke this down is first, Eve would have to determine that her kids need to be picked up. And we really saw this through multiple different ways. One, if if Rebecca had given her access to her contacts and her calendar and more information, then Eve would already know through calendar reminders and contacts that she potentially could have kids that needed to be taken care of. Another way that Eve could have figured this out is through just demographic data, understanding that women her age have a high chance of having children, especially since she's already married. And through this information, Eve could also request and ask, do you have kids? Would you like me to help you figure out how to take care of them while you're at the hospital? The second step would really be sort of cross-referencing her contacts and information or to find the babysitter. So in our story, Eve already knew the babysitter that Rebecca usually contacts, and she did this through uh, Rebecca's favorites who already had Re Rebecca's babysitter contact saved. And the next step would be cross-referencing the contact information to recent call history. So if there's a particular babysitter that she always calls, then Eve could automatically call this babysitter and schedule the time. And she did this through sending a text message. This way, this really alleviates a lot of the stress and anxiety that Rebecca already has from being in the hospital. So she can really focus on her husband and not about the other tasks she has to do at home. And this is actually a moment that was fueled directly by our research because none of us have kids right now, so it wasn't something that we necessarily would have thought of. But two of our member interviews specifically said, I forgot about my dog and I forgot about my roommate. So while the kids are definitely a different part of the family, it's one of those moments that we saw that sometimes shock overtakes your normal functions and your normal thoughts. And most of the time, for a while, at least at the beginning, our members were talking about how out of body they felt because they weren't thinking and doing the things that they were normally doing. So the second moment that we have was actually when Eve was the emotional support and helped facilitate the human moment. Um, yeah, so we're going to provide that um, emotional support to Rebecca. You need to go through a couple of processes. But first, she uses facial recognition um, to determine and identify that Rebecca is under um, distress. She then also um, analyzes Rebecca's like, social media, such as her Facebook, and um, using sentiment analysis can determine that um, Rebecca prefers direct information and is very emotionally attached to her husband. Um, as a result, we end up deciding that a, smooth, a soothing, calming tone is most appropriate for this circumstance and um, provides Rebecca with direct information about the doctors that are currently working on her husband, as well as the place of um, her husband's heartbeat for reassurance. So we pulled those moments, we made the story out of our user insights. We had a bunch, but these were just kind of the three main categories that helped. Yeah, so um, in our primary research, we uh, conducted numerous interviews with people from varying demographics, and just sort of asked them about their current experience with um, hospital waiting rooms. Um, from these interviews, we were able to deduce 
um, insights about our target user, their goals, motivations, and frustrations. Um, in these interviews, we really got to learn more about the current family's experience. Um, we had circumstances that people described that were similar to having to chase down the hospital staff just to get updates, as well as their strong desire to advocate for the patient. So as a result, um, when we were designing our new experience, we really wanted to keep in mind that the user's primary goal was to stay accurately informed on their loved one's status, and um, they were particularly motivated by ensuring their loved one's um, well-being and comfort. And additionally, these users are currently really frustrated by the lack of compassionate communication and the effort that's required to get status updates. So part of our research was actually finding out what already exists and what's already being done. Some of the things that we did, especially that book that we quoted earlier, talked about a lot of, um, it was basically interior design, almost the way the same, the same way a hospital, uh, an airport would work, where in a lot of cases, especially in children's hospitals, most of the time to make the situation better, what the, what the mid users are presented with are like really fun colors and textures which when you're stressed and you're freaked out and you're not thinking of yourself, that's not really what we saw was going to be the best way. Um, so part of our secondary research was actually seeing what was out there. Yeah, so we really wanted to investigate what sort of like similar services and products already existed in like the app store and the market. And we like settled on these three really popular apps that exist to help with like mental health. Even though this wasn't particular to like a hospital situation, we found that these were really helpful for some people. There was like the Calm app, the Calm app, Pacifica, and Headspace, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with at least one of these. And all of them are not very personalized. They're really just voices that just you plug in with your earphones and you listen to them. And they're really short. And we realized that these apps, while they were good for certain situations, were not good at alleviating stress in a super high intensity situation, like when your loved one gets in a car accident or has to go to the hospital immediately. You would not be wanting to listen to like an app like this. You'd be wanting to talk to a friend, talk to a family member, talk to someone just to get some comfort. And unfortunately, in the current hospital system, this person doesn't exist, which is why we really want Eve to help with this problem. So we see Eve actually being developed in multiple stages because this is obviously a very future thinking experience. Um, the first stage. You yeah, just showing off of that. Um, so like we know was saying, there's currently lots of apps that exist in the marketplace that um, require your attention and are not super helpful in alleviating all the stress points that need uh, attention. But in our case, we were thinking of, while well, we have this idea for Eve to be an omnipresent voice of sorts, we're thinking what sort of like a baseline um, platform that we can um, implement in Viva that's um, aligning with the status quo and not you know, sort of being so futuristic that people can't respond to it or understand it. So just a digital um, platform is what we thought would be a best stage one implementation of Eve. So I'm just going to go through it and talk about what um, Eve's interaction would look like materialized from both the doctor's perspective but also the loved one's uh, perspective. So on the doctor's end, it's pretty um, similar to what you'd see currently in terms of the um, types of information. So a doctor sees obviously who the patient is, um, what kind of accident it was, um, details about the accident, um, as well as medical history, any allergies or uh, restrictions. Um, and then there's a new bit um, at the bottom there um, where you see the emergency contact. And in this case, um, the doctor is aware of the fact that Rebecca, his wife, is connected to Eve, so she's receiving information and is being sort of taken care of so he can be um, focused on the procedures and not too much on updating the family um, and so on. And on the flip side, on Rebecca's end, she sees um, the status of her husband. So um, currently he's getting surgery for internal damage and abdominal issues. Um, and about the surgery um, in the platform, um, you kind of includes a little bit about um, what generally happens in the procedure, what she can expect. Um, for example, it takes about five hours, uh, but we estimate that if there's any um, additional processes that are needed, they can increase the time. Um, as well as any prescribed medicines and um, advised medical care. So any medicine that's advised, or, sorry, prescribed um, in the procedure or is uh, predicted to be prescribed um, can be listed there so with information on um, whether it's fulfilled or not, or it can be picked up, things like that, um, as well as medical care information on how to take care of your husband when he's had surgery. And this is more of a digital moment where we really 
really were so hard on ourselves where we didn't want to focus on having an app because we feel like it wasn't broad enough, but we also didn't want to focus on having a bot or an assistant with a face or identifiable features because that immediately limits the amount of trust that you can create with something when you can assign like physical characteristics. Like I don't like the way its face looks. So in this case, with our system here, this is more something that you would see on a doctor's end because they're running around. This is something that they would need. But from the loved ones end or even the patient's end, this is something that they can take home with them because Eve in this situation lives in the hospital. Eve is not something that is omnipresent in your entire life. It doesn't work that way. It's That's not the most effective use. Um, but this is still that situation where when you go home and you have questions about medications or what happened or insurance, you can still speak to Eve. You can still remember the medications, those types of things. Yeah, like I mentioned, it was just a sort of first stage of presentation. I'm going to quickly sort of more explicitly break down the relationship that Eve has to both the patient, who is George, his wife, as well as um, the um, caretaking and the nurse and the doctors. Um, so for all of them, Eve is a care companion. Um, but for Rebecca, in this situation, she's sort of like a guiding light, um, a kind of um, information resource that she kind of settles into what has happened and how to deal with the situation. Um, and Eve helps Rebecca and George communicate through the process of getting uh, treatment and what happens before and after. Um, and on the other side, what, like I said, the caretaking um, aspects of nurses and doctors, for them, Eve is sort of like a timekeeper, an assistant, and a receptionist, where she's uh, keeping track of all the medication and procedures that are happening, as well as um, handling paperwork and any sort of information that um, Rebecca would need to sign off on or things like that. Um, and just maintaining a baseline sort of knowledge base about the patient and who's there to take care. So then our kind of like future thinking concept, um, when we were going through all of this research, we were really questioning what does a hospital waiting room look like if this was prevalent everywhere? Um, or what is the middle stage? So we actually came up with like a little physical experience. Yeah, so here's a quick little sketch made in SolidWorks. You can see it's basically a pod design. So instead of these like metal benches you see in hospital rooms, we want to get rid of those metal benches and implement these pods uh, in the system. You can see there's like ramp for accessibility, you want to let everyone use these pods. But basically, inside the pods is, you know, there's Eve, Eve the voice assistant, but you also have, let's say, like ambient light, and you're able to display an EKG signal and stuff. We really want it to be the user connected to Eve alone. No one else in there, no one is interrupting. It's just Eve and you. And that's kind of what we see happening in the future, what we want Eve to be. And we, I mean, one day, this was, I mean, this could almost be a middle ground. One day, one of the, big, the biggest things that we focused on was privacy. And so we understand that just talking out loud to a voice assistant is not exactly a private thing. Um, so this might be, from our scene earlier, this could be a middle step. But you have a, a grief room, or you have the Eve compartment, all of those types of things. We were just trying to find a way to um, empathize with our users and the people that we talk to that this needs to be private so people become comfortable. So the next thing we want to talk about is the, the permissions that Eve has. So in our scene here, we had Rebecca. Rebecca allowed Eve to access a lot of her personal information. So she allowed listening. She allowed Eve to react to what she said. Uh, she also allowed Eve to use her, bank, her credit card information to buy the gummies, for example. But let's say we have another user who's a little more restrictive of their information and wants Eve to know a little bit less. So we have, we have opt, we, we're able to opt the user is able to opt out of certain permissions. Now, this, we don't intend to remove the core functionality of Eve, which Eve tries to be proactive and tries to recommend things. But without these permissions, Eve has access to a little less information. So as a result, Eve is, Eve is going to have to guess a little more. Eve's going to have to ask more questions directly to the user, rather than trying to get it like through like a database, through APIs, through stuff like that. Eve is just going to have to directly ask Anne and in this case too, with our, um, we, I mean, even some of our users, most of them were really technology proficient. A lot, and then a few of them didn't feel very comfortable. So even in the situation, if you gave Eve no permissions whatsoever, it should still function as some sort of assistance, some sort of help. Because when you walk into the hospital, the nurse at the front desk doesn't know anything about you, and Eve can still function in that way. Um, the one thing that we really wanted to focus on was how do we make this system that would know a lot about you and be in a very private setting, how do you make it human? 
Um, and so it took us a while to come out, but these are our eight filters that we're focusing on. Uh, if Eve is going to determine the context of the situation, the literacy of medical terms, the security of your data, privacy, timing, demographic environment, and priority, um, even the mental state of what that person is going through at that moment before Eve would ever give a response or give an output. These are the eight filters that we go through to ensure that it's timely, it's said in the right tone, they're addressed the right way, all of those kinds of things that we do as humans without ever thinking about it. Um, so, oh, um, to wrap up, we wanted to focus on building an experience that connects loved ones through a care companion, providing timely, simplified information, and alleviating the fear and anxiety induced by unexpected hospital visits. The key word being experience, because this is an awful experience as it stands right now. Um, and there are a lot of details that we've worked out, but this is definitely something that we wanted to affect change, even in the text of this class. And the way we actually came up with the name Eve is that it is actually derived from Latin, from Latin name Eva, and it means to live or give life, which we thought that was apt because we were trying to help people live better lives, even in a pretty awful situation. So that is Eve. Thank you.